slope here or we need to adjust the level of this weir. And we can, uh, I, I don't know of a single situation where we didn't have better performance in actuality. And then also love to shout out to the district and they're ramping up to, uh, voted last month to ramp up the monitoring. Uh, I think 40 new stations in the St. Lucie River in estuary, which will give us great information. And there seems to be more willingness to look at that data and, say, and, and actually say, here's an area where we need to look at. Will you all be able to post that data? I, I believe it is. You'll be able to get it. That's a good point. I get that question out. Really. One more question, Diane. Um, I thought we already had the C23, 24, and 25, but it says in a newspaper article that we need to buy more land for construction projects. Can you tell me a little about that? Yeah, so I, and, and I, maybe the Dr. Gray is going to address this, oh, okay. but the only place we really have a land acquisition um, uh, need IRL South yet is the C25 where there's been no land acquisition ever. And then I also would like to say, nobody really likes to talk about this, but IRL South also had a massive natural area storage and treatment land acquisition component. We've got 60,000 acres left in that program uh, that at some point we need to make sure, hey, don't forget this. This was part of the yellow book, was part of the, the solution. And, uh, but, but yeah, the, the, the C23, 24 North and South, um, they more or less resolved those land issues. The South had the issue with the archaeological impacts, and they were able to um, change the footprint. They took the, that portion on the South end, they moved it to the West end. They've done the Phase One and Phase Two archaeal review, and mm -hmm. that's clear. So they're moving ahead with design. So we have the only land acquisition left in the IRS for this C25 per project, per project. But there's still a whole big chunk of natural area storage. Natural, natural area. Blair, really quick, and then we've got to move to the state um, Just a quick question in reference to a previous uh, uh, slide presentation here on the local watershed, 68 or 70 percent of the nutrients coming into our local watershed are from ag. Yet you're excited about the conversion from, from sewer to septic or septic to sewer, and, and, and that's really a small percentage. So it kind of ties into what we've been hearing in terms of the overall quality of the water and then also in terms of the idea that maybe there is the chance for land acquisition for more treatment and storage. Is that a potential? I, um, I, I don't totally so understand the question, but I know what I want to say. Can, I we think put, can we put more on agriculture yeah. than we do on local? So let's, let's clarify. Let me just sense. kind of clarify. Yeah, agriculture, they lumped in and the main map all at the top of them. They're the biggest contributor to all the canal systems and all the land use that's primarily in the worship, in St. Louis worship. The, the accomplishments of Mark County, be it septic or whatever, the stormwater treatment areas for Mark County, they're one of the 22 entities in that list. The agriculture's at the top. Mark County's doing what they're doing to, to do that. There are other entities that do it. Now you bring up a relevant point, and that is related to the land use changes within the, within the watershed how do they affect this runoff that's coming into our watershed, disregarding the light like the utility construction? But I don't know that Mark County has a plan to say address that specifically. We have to work on the state agencies and others to EDP and others to address how you're going to monitor and control the agricultural runoff, which is at the top. Yeah, th those are great points. One thing I would say is that um, you know, I, I like to use the illustration that Mayor Julie, Giuliani coined with the broken window concept. If we're not doing our best here, then it's easier for people to overlook their, you know, the other shortcomings that are coming into to our area. So but if we make our area pristine, then we're handling things as best we can. It's more offensive if someone else is, is, is discharging to us. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, John. <laughs>
what we are getting, so do not for a second fall asleep. <laughs> do not fall asleep for a second. You must work harder yes. every day or we will lose this for sure. Because this isn't just a change operationally, this is a change culturally. And that is the most significant change you can make to any institution or any um, country or state anywhere. So um, they have been bending, their, bending backwards trying to send more water south. I mean, I almost laugh because, I mean, they almost, I can see it, like they're afraid not to send it. And it's not because of me or anybody else, it's because they want to they wanna do it. They want to do it. I don't know if you saw um, the um, video that was done on YouTube with Drew Bartlett and Colonel Kelly of the Army Corps of Engineers. You have got to go online and pull this up on the South Florida Water Management District's website. It was done right after Hurricane Dorian. And I just sat there watching this thing and thinking, is this really happening? You know, am I really wanted watching this? The Corps Pat is making a cultural change too. It's and we did it. It would not have happened without us. Um, as far as the district itself, there are lots of priorities, but the main priorities I'm learning are ones that are new to me. The main priority is to open up the bottom of the system, like Tamiami Trail, they're getting rid of the old Tamiami Trail, the 333 structure. You can't send water from anywhere if you don't have the bottom of the system open, and many people have said that. So um, they're talking about a wall to help the water not upset the people who are growing agriculture and homestead. You know, these things take time, but they are working on that. The EAA reservoir, uh, that has a lot of complications, but the district is trying to outsmart their friends, the Army Corps, and get it to happen faster than having to go through all the NEPA permitting, but um, it, is, it is happening. Um, <coughs> big, boring, important thing. If Gary Goforth were here, he would be jumping up and down. The, the district at our last meeting, we opened up, I'm not gonna go into the numbers because it'll just make you fall asleep, but we opened up rulemaking, okay? And rulemaking for works of the district. And this was brought up to everyone's attention with really Mark Perry yeah. and Gary Goforth. And basically, that means that there are a lot of nuances to it, but think of all of the canals, even in some of our agricultural yards, that in time may end up going back to, to a district canal, okay? So it's rulemaking on making sure that that water is a certain quality when it gets to the district canals. The problem with all of this is that there is no mechanism for enforcement, okay? That is the problem between the district the um, uh, FDACs, which is the Department of Agriculture, and then the Department of Environmental Protection. There is no mechanism for enforcement. People hate that word. Republicans won't even say that word. So we have to find a way. Um, I don't like to call it enforcement. I think it's kind of like a cultural expectation. You know what I mean? Like, let's say in the old days, um, I remember when I was a kid um, in Martin County, going to the Martin County Fair, people were throwing trash out the windows. I'm not kidding, when I was like six years old. And that was like normal, okay? That was a normal expectation. People just didn't realize that you know, that was an awful thing to do. You wouldn't do that today. You would very rarely see that happen today. That's a cultural shift, as much as it is a legal shift. We have to have a cultural shift in the expectations of people with their water. Okay, and um, we are on the right track to to get that. Um, monitoring is happening. It will really come in over the next year. That's great. I'm like, yay, we're getting more monitoring. But if there is no um, rule for enforcement, you know, what's the, what's the point? So that we have to work on that. And when the rulemaking comes forward, I hope that you all will come and talk. And you guys, we cannot bash each other like Fred Flintstone over the head in the morning, okay? We have got to have empathy and understand that other people, we're all in this together, we are, and we have to find a way together to make it better, you know, but please, once that opens up, I'll be asking you to come to that. Um, 
I just wanted to say, even though I really don't like this conversation, because uh, I don't like to kill any animal, but um, they're putting a lot of money into, into the Python program. And Governor DeSantis is very serious about this. Overarching, that's invasive species. That can be in, in, in invasive plants, animals, um, but that's a very real issue. Um, and uh, if you ever see a python, there have been a few reported uh, out in the Okeechobee area, you have to make sure that they're caught uh, so that they don't reproduce. Why we don't have the problem here that they have in Broward, so to speak, is because we don't have a breeding population. If a breeding population <coughs> starts up here, game over, okay? So this is a very serious thing, even though we think it doesn't touch us. Um, Toby Overdorf, I was very appreciative. He brought a number of legislators to the South Florida Water Management District yesterday. And these are people that are not normally exposed. They were introduced to the new culture. And um, they went through the simulation game at the district for Lake Okeechobee Waters, just like they did at the Losum. Uh, Ed, Keller, Ed Keller from TC Palm did a great article on that you may have seen. And I will end with um, head scientist um, Calvin Niedbauer at the end of it and he's been there 26 years or something he said I have to say that I'm noticing a shift in these games it's not a game it's a simulation but it's kind of like a game because you're a team and you're working to try to manage like Okeechobee and he said over the past you know year and a half even before the new board he said more people when they do this game they're trying to protect the estuaries. Yeah. And I thought, yeah. excellent, hallelujah. Yes. Thank you.
there's, there's, uh, it's important that if you have something to add or you have something to make sure that you really want them to hear that you sign up. And usually they're a couple of weeks out that you need to get on the list to, because they try to run them fairly quickly. There's all the legislators in one spot. They all have busy schedules. Getting back to that, as they meet in Tallahassee, they're meeting like every other week on committee weeks. The uh, Appropriations Committee met for the Senate last week, and you can follow it online. If you go to my Florida Senate or my Florida House, uh, you can pull any of those uh, websites up, and they will have actually a, a video of the committee meetings and those types of things that are going on. So if you want to follow them a little bit more closely as far as and if I were following committees, I'd follow appropriations in several of those in both the House and Senate. I'd follow natural resources and agriculture in both of those. And that would give you a real good feel on where the water issues are going to come from and, and what the stances are of some of your elected officials, not necessarily from our area, but from around the state, which is important to get a feel for because everyone has their own slice of the pie they're trying to get. So you need to make sure that you understand that and then you can get back with your legislators and urge them to help you in those areas may not have some of their constituents, uh, not, not the constituents, but their, their cohorts uh, in the legislative branches. Uh, they may be able to go and talk to them before the session starts and as bills are being filed and that type of thing. Uh, what else did I have here? I don't think there's much. Oh, the other thing I wanted to add is right now they're spending a week up there and usually a week home and a week up and a week home. So as you start to follow these things, when they're home, don't count on going to see them during the session because you'll talk to staff because they're going to be so busy they don't want they, they don't they might want to talk to you but it's very difficult to get their actual time but if you have something to say to them now is the time to look at their schedules contact their offices and see them at home see them. don't see them in tallahassee see them at home you're their constituent get in their office get face to face with them and tell them what your concerns are that's this, this is now the time between now and January, if you want to sit down with them and talk with them, because once the session starts, you won't get a whole lot of their time, and a lot of the bills will have already been filed, and the wars will already have begun in the back room. So if you want to be part of the back room war, start now. I just want to say, with that in mind, call Mr. Overdorf, yep. since he just had this connection to uh, the district, and um, you know, I'll leave, it, I'll leave it there. Call him up and ask to meet him face to face or talk with him. You know, that's it. Call that's right. Him. I mean, George is right. If, if, if you don't have time at these delegation meetings because there's a big agenda, a lot of people, they got three minutes. You've got more than three minutes if you can get into their office. And you schedule a the time, they'll give you 10 or 15 yeah. minutes. So yeah. a time, sometimes even a half hour, depending on how many people they're you they're with you or a group or an organization you represent. If, if you are representing a larger organization, you'll get a pretty good piece of their time. But uh, now I can I cannot emphasize that enough. I've been up there tons of times, and once the session starts, it's very very difficult to get a huge chunk of their time. Any time you get, you have to have an elevator speech because within about a minute or five minutes or whatever, they're back out the door, or you're at you're out the door. So that's just the nature of the beast. It's not anything that's uh, it's just the way the system works. But if you have something serious that you want to talk about, now is the time. And I'd say to George it is available to talk to you one on one about yeah. how to track these, how to get you know, yeah, George anytime. is an absolute expert in state uh, walking halls in the state and getting things done. <laughs> yes. so, uh, actually, actually, I actually don't get yes, lost in the house side so. anymore, so that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, George. Thanks. But any anytime I can help, uh, my address is on the website, I think, or whatever. But uh, I, if, if you want to know how to navigate any of these sites, I played with them for quite a bit, and, and there's a lot of information just on the two that I gave you. The, the My Florida House and My Florida Senate gives you committees, it gives you times and dates and meetings. It has a no-cost tracker for all the bills, so if there's a bill you're interested in, you can hit that tracker, you can put that bill number in there, and you're overload for your email system because you'll get them every day. And then you'll have to start weeding out the ones that you don't want. But it will give you the... Part of the advantage to that is you will see the changes in these bills as they progress and who's making those changes. In other words, what what, what committee, what, what person, what representative, and those are key pieces of ammunition in the long-term fight. And so a lot of us have been to lots of meetings. The one kickoff meeting they had in Clueston on August uh, 20, 20th was a really good kickoff. <clears throat> Some of us were there. Um, then they've had PDT meetings and meetings since then. Alex, you 
want to give us a quick update on Losa? Yep, we have uh, a system operating manual. We're, we're still working on Losa. It's a long process. It's going to take a, a few years. But I think in the, the early um, kind of volley, we, we won. So we got to keep that up. Uh, the Army Corps last week was at IRCC. They described human health in a, in a three-part term, which is brand new. Uh, the dike, blood control, and algal blooms. And so that is that is unlike anything we've ever had. In 2018, the Corps didn't pay attention to what was in the discharges. We have a letter from Brian Mass confirming that. They, they said We said, do you track toxic algae discharges? And they said, we track all discharges, i.e. no. We track them. So, so, <laughs> we track. so, so now they're tracking discharges. The next step is they need to take into account all the different harms. So for our community, uh, we have the facts, right? We don't have to worry about getting into an argument we can't win. We will take whatever the facts are and play them out. And so what we have to do for the rest of this process, which is several years, is to get in there and make them consider all our different people, pieces of it, right? So, so they're weighing consequences, they're weighing harms, they're weighing benefits. They have to do that with the facts. They only get the facts if we inject them. So you got to show up. you got to go to these PDT meetings. you got to keep injecting the facts. I, I, one more thing, and I'll go to you, Maggie. Um, that is like, it's a pretty good thing, right, the regulation schedule. We see that the regulation schedule greatly impacts our community, the health of Florida. Uh, we still don't know as a community, and we need the South Florida Water Management and the board to tell us, how much water can we send to the south maximum amount in the dry season to benefit Florida Bay and everybody's national park. We don't have that number, we need that number. We know that if we gave, as, as Paul Gray mentioned, between 800 and 1,000 CFS to the Caloosahatchee, we're looking at about 420,000 acre feet, which, which results in about a foot off the lake. So we can take a foot off the lake, reduce the likelihood of discharges, benefit the Caloosahatchee's ecology, uh, and put us in better shape. We can do a similar thing south, we don't know what extent. So those are the kind of things we have to work out. Now, now, LOSUM is important, right? We're playing within, LOSUM is a regulation schedule. Regulation schedules are promulgated pursuant to laws. So, so the law here is the 1948 Central and Southern Florida Project, and LOSUM happens according to that. The highest value target for this community, we've been fighting for it for, from the 60s, is to go after that law. Losum is fine, Losum is good, it's important, we can do a lot of good stuff, <coughs> but the most, the best, the highest value thing we can do is to change that 1948 law. Brian Mast has introduced the Protect Florida Act. Uh, that is the only bill in Congress to change that 1948 law. Bob Graham has called for it on two occasions in EPCO, and this community is really the only community working on it, to change that 1948 law. So that is the highest value target this whole thing. This community cannot forget that. We have to play LOSUM out to the maximum extent possible, and we're gonna get some good benefit out of LOSUM, but the highest value target is that CNSF project, and that's where we have to change. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. Maggie, you got a comment? Yeah, just briefly, and I think we all know this, but we need to redo it again. Every time we sound like we're doing something better, <clears throat> then you don't feel we have to go to all these meetings and things. But every yeah. time there's a hearing, usually it gets out that there's a hearing, sometimes not until three days before, the week before, <clears throat> sometimes so far in advance that you don't get there. What we need to be coordinating with different kind of groups is to tell the people who will come what the simpler messages need to be, to translate the complicated acronyms and official yes. stuff yes. into honest, honest concepts of right. what happens. So the more each of your agencies, each of you who sends an email out, each of you who gets other people involved and say, not only there's a LOSA meeting, and good grief, we need to have you there because there are going to be 500 million people from Blades Lives Matter saying you're trying to kill them and Palm Beach County is going to be saying that you're stealing their water. But here are some real simple factual concepts you need to get across. Thank you, good, good, good. I just can't mention to that end. Yeah, 25 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a it's web meeting. Yeah, it's, it's a web meeting. Yeah. 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 The PDT meetings that are mentioned are every month. Uh, today is that web, web meeting. October 24th in Dade County. Uh, November 
21st in Okeechobee, and then December 19th, uh, they haven't announced where that is. But those are each month they're having these. Again, and PDT is project, project delivery, delivery team. team. <laughs> so it's actually the delivery team is a, made up of a whole lot of agency groups uh, from all agencies, not just the court and district, but other agencies that sit together on this PDT. And their, their purpose is to deliver the project, deliver an alternative of our recommended project schedule. So they look for input from the audience, from general public. And they'll take written comments as well as, as a verbal comments. So as Maggie said, it's up to us to get there, take a simple message to the stand, and say our few words. So appreciate that input. Uh, uh, we're going to go into the Rivers Coalition updates. I think Dan Merritt's here to talk about Speaker Bureau. Before he does, there was another meeting on the 19th uh, last week about the IDS, and you'll just not have started it yet. Integrated delivery schedule. And this is a new schedule compared to the older schedule that they used to have that they're proposing to update. Now it's updated with new funding, new projects, new things that are coming on. So the core is taking into account the state's upper level of funding as well as, as the core is looking at federal uh, increase to 200 million. Of course, it's still back to the 63 million the president requested because it's a continuing resolution until they pass appropriations. So until November, we may still be at 63, but we're looking to get 200, and that's the state's 200 million to in, implement the city grid delivery schedule. But I encourage you to get to these meetings. This was September, and they're going to continue in October up in D.C., and it has a real detailed thing on the back. So this is on, again, the board's website about integrated delivery schedule. It has the RL project and all these other projects. Dan, let's talk about speaker. Uh, by the way, on these meetings, if you'll go to the core site and get on Erica's uh, email list, then you will get messages, email messages on all these PDT meetings, etc. So I encourage you to do that. Todd gave me about 30 minutes of preparing for March. Help me, Mark. Exactly. <laughs> I, I want to get it right because everybody knows Todd's very specific. First off, there's no current report on. Uh, speaker activity has kind of been slow the last several uh, months. However, the Speakers Bureau is open for business, so please contact either Todd, Bart, or go to the website and schedule uh, for your organization or anybody else's organization that would like to have a speaker come out. He's, he's very anxious. Uh, secondly, uh, remember our objective. Our objective is no discharge. And he wanted me to make sure that I uh, emphasize that. Please, when he comes back, tell him I did. Uh, next are local issues. Well, uh, basically, it gave a kind of an updated water quality report. Our weekly map is showing a really detrimental, as, as Jim uh, mentioned, about the South Fork. Again, all kind of local runoff issues of what's going on. Uh, our local report also looks at the grade over time since the beginning of the year, and it's really dropped in June uh, when we started to not have discharge from the lake in June, but a lot of this local runoff and rain has come in through the canals, through the discharge, and the salinities so have dropped. We're down to about, as we said, about 15 parts per thousand or 16 right here at Roosevelt Ridge, which is okay. Above 10 is best for, for the oysters and others. Uh, but up in the south and, and north forks, it's really dropped, and, and the DO dissolved oxygen and other things have really dropped, and the turbidity has picked up. So even though we don't have discharges, you'll see a lot of brown water, and that turbid water being upset by all that silt sediment that's been deposited in the estuary in big areas. We get heavy winds, like we got with Dorian, but also heavy winds. That'll stir up that silt sediment, and with those discharges, even from local runoff, will come out and almost form the same plume that Jackie and her husband have taken of this big plumes out the inlet. So it's really detrimental. Uh, unfortunately, those salinities, though, in the outer estuary are still at about 25 to 26 parts per thousand. And, and in the outer estuary where the seagrasses are, that's staying pretty healthy. So we're, we're glad that that's, again, no discharge from the lake, but our local runoff is still a big issue. And, uh, any river keeper update? I don't see Marty Sorry. today. But Gail's here. Uh, Marty one. has another eye infection. He's uh, got three appointments. So he's regulating uh, biopsy and a um, bunch of medical problems. So he said he's sorry. Uh, well, Marty gets better. Okay, great. Uh, member comments and, and 
announcements. Any member have we got a couple here? Jackie first, and then we'll go to the Well, a couple of things that I, I, I need to talk about. I don't want to sound like a broken record. And I don't want to mention the word phonograph, so I sound like Biden. But anyway, um, <laughs> first thing is local issues. We can't ignore growth and its effect on everything you've been talking about today. And the Martin County Commission is doing some really bad things, in my opinion. And the Martin not County Sarah, majority. Not Sarah. <laughs> Jensen, uh, it's going to benefit Friends of the Everglades. We're really appreciative as friends. Uh, 